This is Matthew Cratter from Trady University, and today I want to answer the question, is BIP119 an attack on Bitcoin? Does this mean the end of Bitcoin? I've been, I've been getting a lot of worried questions about this, so I thought I'd cover it today. So what is a BIP? A BIP is what's called a Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, and it's a suggestion as to what could be added to the Bitcoin Core software. I'm going to link to this GitHub page where you can see all the BIPs. Some of these have been added to Bitcoin, some have not. In particular, we're going to be talking today about BIP 119, which I will link to here as well if you want to take a look at the code. BIP 119, you might also hear it referred to as OPCTV or OPCTV or CTV. CTV stands for Check Template. Verify, And we don't really have to talk about what that means in detail, but we will discuss in general what BIP119 is trying to do. This is a BIP that was proposed by a guy named, named uh, Jeremy Rubin. I'm going to link to his website here if you want to read about him. He has founded a company called Judica that is focused on developing a smart contract programming language for Bitcoin. He's not a member of the Bitcoin core dev team but he is uh, someone uh, prominent in the space, and he's trying to push through BIP-119. BIP-119 has to do with adding a certain opcode. That's why it's called OPCTV, uh, a certain opcode that would allow covenants to be added to Bitcoin Core. What's a covenant? A covenant is where you add an additional restriction that's basically one step ahead in a transaction. So for example, if we were going to send Bitcoin from address A to address B, we would put, uh, if we wanted to add a covenant, which is not yet possible, I don't believe, we would add a, a, a covenant and that would put a spending restriction on address B. So an example would be, I'm sending you some Bitcoin, but you, when you receive that Bitcoin, are only going to be able to send it to these 10 specified Bitcoin addresses. Maybe there'd be a white list. You could do this as a blacklist. There are many ways of doing it, but this script would add this, this kind of functionality. Now, one problem with this that just jumps out at you is this could hurt Bitcoin's fungibility. If uh, there's some Bitcoin that can only be spent to certain addresses and some Bitcoin that can be sent, spent to every address, then it's almost like you've created two different classes of Bitcoin UTXOs or chunks of Bitcoin. This could hurt Bitcoin's fungibility. It could also create a way, this script could create a way for, to, for regulators to exert their power over Bitcoin companies, regulated exchanges, anyone who interacts with the protocol, and force them to do things that are bad for Bitcoin. And what are these things? What are the unintended consequences? Well, we don't really know for sure. And right now it's very complicated and there's no clear consensus. You can go on Twitter and spend your entire day reading about this debate. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. I've noticed that a lot of people who watch this channel are not yet subscribers. So if you're a regular watcher, I'd really appreciate if you hit the subscribe button. So surprisingly, the real controversy here about BIP-119, when you look into it, is not so much about the particulars of covenants or BIP-119. It's more a debate about how this code should or could be incorporated into Bitcoin Core and what's the proper process for that. And it's this question, should we use a speedy trial activation to get BIP-119 added more quickly? What's a speedy trial activation? We've talked about this a couple times. It's basically when you let the miners, the Bitcoin miners, signal whether they're in favor of the upgrade by adding a little flag or a yes or no to the blocks that they mine. So if, for example, you can set this up in different ways, but I think Taproot works something like this, where if you got 95% yeses over a certain period of time, so each block had 95% uh, 90, of the blocks had a yes flag in it over a certain period of time, it was like a couple weeks, uh, the code would get locked in, the developers would allow it to get locked into Bitcoin Core, and then it would get activated a few months later. So this was used, as I said, in 2021 for the Taproot upgrade. Taproot just refers to this combination of BIPs that were all sort of simultaneously added. BIP 340, which was Schnorr signatures, BIP 341, which was Taproot, which gave its name to the, the whole upgrade, and then BIP 342, which was TAP script. Now, the difference is, 
and the reason speedy trial may have been appropriate for the taproot upgrade is these are BIPs that been, had been debated for years. I think Schnorr signatures were first proposed like in 2013 or 2014. They really go way back, likewise uh, for some of the other BIPs. And there was a broad consensus in favor of these BIPs. And so then the process was, because there's this broad consensus saying that this would be good for Bitcoin, the speedy trial activation was used and the miners were allowed to signal whether they were in favor of this. And they did signal that they were in favor. We got that 95% uh, majority and this was merged into Bitcoin Core and activated in, I believe, November of 2021. To do a speedy trial activation, in other words, to take a uh, this new code and have it approved by everyone, have it approved by the miners and then incorporated, I believe you should first have a broad consensus among all of these groups. And this is what we had for Taproot, which made a speedy trial activation appropriate for Taproot. You should have a broad consensus among the general Bitcoin community. This doesn't mean among regulators, does, this doesn't mean among attackers, but it means a, genu gen a general consensus among the different constituents who are involved with Bitcoin. And just off the top of my head, you have the miners, you have the exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken and Gemini. You have people like myself who run a full node. So you have the whole Bitcoin full node network. Many people are anonymous on this. You have the makers of these nodes, Umbral, uh, Open Node, Start9, companies like this. Uh, you have developers who both work on Bitcoin Core and those who just have uh, development expertise and weigh in on it. People like Jeremy Rubin and other people he's debating this with. You have the people who actually use Bitcoin, merchants, people who use it to buy things, to sell things. And then you have what you might call Bitcoin influencers. I guess I might be under this category as a very, a very small influencer. And there obviously are influencers who are much more into crypto and try to use uh, their, their, uh, try to use the name of Bitcoin to push other, other cryptocurrencies, etc. But you have these these broad groups. There's probably some groups that that I'm forgetting. But it's very clear that for the Taproot upgrade, we had a broad consensus uh, among all these different groups. Or among, it's not even a democracy. It's not a majority. It's something much more messy and ambiguous. But there was a broad consensus in favor of Taproot. We're very far away from getting this for BIP 119. And I think this is why there's this pushback against doing a speedy trial activation of BIP 119. For these reasons, I'm personally against using speedy trial in this case. Maybe in two years from now, it will be appropriate after the community has had the necessary debate. I feel like it's just getting started. I feel like it's very, it's very technical. It's very complicated. I don't understand the unintended consequences of BIP 119. And it's, it feels like it just came on the scene. I know it's been around for a while, but it feels like the debate is just heating up and smart people are trying to reach a rough consensus on what to do. I do believe Bitcoin should be hard to upgrade, difficult to change. At a certain point, it's going to become so ossified that it will become almost impossible to change, or this, or this will be the tradition where real Bitcoiners don't want it to change. And uh, it basically all gets locked in permanently. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we should ever close the door to future upgrades and developments because you never know. There could be a 51% attack. There could be there could be other attacks where we need to change. Uh, there could be the development of quantum computers where we need to change some of the cryptography that's underlying underlying Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm not against upgrades in general, but I do think they should be uh, they should be debated for years, and there should be. Uh, they shouldn't be very controversial by the time you're ready to do a speedy trial activation. There should be a rough social consensus. Bitcoin should remain hard to upgrade and change. And we're seeing we're seeing all this pushback. I think it is still very difficult to change and upgrade. I know Jeremy Rubin's been frustrated by this, basically trying to, to talk to people and say, how can I push this through? And I don't think there is a way to push it through. That's one of the amazing things about Bitcoin. Bitcoin being difficult to upgrade and being difficult to change is what makes it anti-fragile, what makes it resistant to attacks. This really is the $21 trillion question. What is the right process for upgrading or changing the Bitcoin core software? 
And there are two sides to this. If you provide a really clear path for how this should work, then it gives attackers a map for how to quickly push through changes that could hurt Bitcoin in the same way that we now have all this corruption in the House of Representatives and in Congress, and we have all these lobbyists. It's, it, there's, there's ways to capture the system. And we don't want it to be as clear cut in Bitcoin because we don't want the system to be able to be captured uh, by rent seekers and regulators. So that's, the, that's why you don't want a clear path to how to upgrade Bitcoin Core. But the problem is if you don't have a clear path, then how can you know when a particular BIP is ready to be added? There is this general feeling that Taproot was ready. There is a general consensus. But how do we know when, when we've arrived? Is it like uh, the famous judge talking about pornography saying, uh, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. I think, I, I think this is something very similar to that. Where you need to, um, where it's, it's not really clear how this how this is is done, um, but it's done through uh, through a, a broad debate that takes place always over a series of years. Now you'll hear a, a lot of you are disturbed by this process too and how messy it is, but I would suggest that Bitcoin is messy in this way and upgrades are messy. There's lots of chaos. There's lots of toxicity. There's threats of hard forks. Why is it so messy though? It's messy because, and this is the clearest sign that this is true, it's a really messy process because no one controls Bitcoin. When Vitalik Buterin wants a new upgrade to Ethereum, things go fairly smoothly because he is the leader, he has a bully pulpit, people listen to him, he's got a lot of power over his dev team and over the entire, uh, the entire ecosystem. We don't have a leader with Bitcoin. It's messy, it's leaderless, it's truly decentralized, and it's this rough social consensus. If I did define Bitcoin, I would define it as a social consensus. It's not necessarily even the code. It's more of a social movement or a social consensus where we all get together and we agree on who owns these UTXOs. We agree that there's a max supply of 21 million. And other than that, whether however you express that social consensus, what, what cryptographic algorithms you use to secure it, how do you, you transmit blocks, etc. These are all minor details compared to the broad social consensus. This is what people don't understand about quantum. Quantum computers will never wreck Bitcoin because there's a very strong core community that will do whatever they can to keep Bitcoin going. Bitcoin is not SHA-256. We could use something else if we needed to, if, if we were threatened by uh, quantum, quantum computing. So Bitcoin is messy, messy it's decentralized, and it, there's a history of people who try to change Bitcoin getting wrecked if they try to force something through. And I, wouldn't, I would not wish this on Jeremy, but I think he risks really risking his reputation by pushing maybe a little bit too hard on this. We had the whole Bitcoin Cash fiasco a few years back. And people like Jihan Wu, uh, founder of Bitmain, Roger Ver, who were pushing through Bitcoin Cash and trying to get larger blocks, they ended up completely destroying their reputations in the community. You can read more about them here. Jihan Wu, Roger Ver. These are not people who are respected in the community anymore, in spite of the fact that Roger Ver used to be called uh, the Bitcoin Jesus. You just never, never even hear about him anymore. And for people who invested in Bitcoin Cash, uh, instead of BTC, it's been a complete uh, disaster for them. So to conclude, is BIP 119 an attack on Bitcoin? I don't think so. I think Jeremy Rubin probably has good intentions. He obviously wants to bootstrap his company that's built on smart contracts. Um, but that being said, I think it's a big mistake to try to rush something through. I don't think there's been enough debate around BIP 119 to do a speedy trial activation. And if it is attempted, if uh, if Jeremy Rubin and whoever whoever else tries to push this through, if the miners try to push it through, I think it's going to fall flat on its face. Either either you won't get a consensus among miners; it's going to be very hard to get to ninety five percent. But even if you were able to get some sort of consensus among the Bitcoin miners, it's unlikely that the full nodes will go along. I'm not going to go along with it at this stage. Maybe later when I understand this BIP better, I'll be in favor of it. But as a full node, I'm going to figure out how to censor blocks and refuse to propagate them in my full node if something like this goes through. The worst thing that could happen, we could end up with a hard fork in Bitcoin. We'd end up with two separate coins and we'd see how that would play out. It wasn't a big deal for Bitcoin Cash. 
the smart people, when they got their, uh, the smart Bitcoiners, when they got their Bitcoin cash from the fork, they immediately dumped it and turned it into Bitcoin. I think something similar uh, could happen if if we go that far. I don't think it's going to get quite that dire. A hard fork would be a quite traumatic uh, process to go through. But I think Bitcoin is anti-fragile. It is robust and you really have a choice if you don't like this messiness you can go for a corporate vc cryptocurrency like uh, solana for example uh, which seems to have a lot of trouble even staying online or you could go for something that's controlled uh, by a weird autist like uh, vitalik buterin or something like ripple which is clearly a super scammy coin that's that's what you can settle for you can have go for corporate or vc coin if uh, if that's what you want uh, but the, the nice thing about Bitcoin is it does have this decentralization. It has this messiness, and you can see it so clearly at times like this. I'm going to try to figure out, as I said, how to, how to censor blocks if this were to ever go through, just using, my, uh, using Bitcoin Core and my full node. And I'm sure that the companies that make full nodes, companies like Umbral, and I might, I might have to get one as a result of this, they're going to make it easy to, uh, for, for full nodes to censor blocks that uh, incorporates something. If this if this is rushed through or if the miners try to signal, we could also censor the blocks that they are using to signal. So we'll see how this plays out. I am not worried. This is not an existential threat to Bitcoin. This is the messiness of consensus working its way out. Bitcoin has been through this before. The worst thing that happens is you end up with Bitcoin and some other, uh, some other fork coin, and then you can decide what to do with both sides of them. And you could also hold both sides of them. You could hold BTC and you could hold new BTC and just see which one uh, wins. So I don't think this, uh, a number of you have written to me saying you're going to sell your Bitcoin because you're so scared about this mess. Well, this is, this is, uh, this is the real world messiness. This isn't controlled Disneyland coin like Solana. This is something that has its, its own independent life. It's completely decentralized. It's chaotic and it's messy. And yet it survived since 2008, 2009. Bitcoin has been through a lot. And every time someone tries to attack it and change it quickly, they end up hurting themselves more than they hurt Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, as a result, gets even stronger. I'm going to link to an interesting website that, that compiles a lot of the resources you can use. If you're more technical, you can scroll down to the bottom here and read all the, the BIP 119 explainers. I may go into some of these in the future if, if, if it becomes necessary, but I thought it was important to realize from this video, and my main point here is this is, this is a debate really about how changes should be made to Bitcoin Core and about speedy trial activation. It's less about BIP 119, but if you want to go deeper technically, I will link to this in the description notes below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.